I'm going to present some uh, results of a project which I've done in Sardinia, which is the uh, one of the big Italian islands in the Mediterranean. Uh, so I've been working there for several years, but the results I'm going to present now are results from uh, last summer season. So in Sardinia, the, the, the archaeology I'm interested in there are the rocket tombs. So these are chamber tombs, a bit similar to what we have here in Scotland, except that they are cut into the bedrock, so they are not built by megalithic uh, elements. So you can see here uh, on those pictures that they're usually found all together in symmetry, so usually in the scan of uh, limestone landscapes. So they are symmetries. They usually are quite complex in terms of architectural design. So you have a, a small plan here that shows the entrance and then usually have an empty chamber and then the main chamber with decorations, car decorations or painted decorations in them. And then you have additional small cells on the, on the side of the main chamber where presumably the, uh, the dead were deposited. Uh, so there are quite a lot of them in Sardinia, so 3,500 uh, of these tombs, which are also known locally as Domus de Llanas, which means the House of the Fairies. Uh, and uh, they are interesting as well because of their decoration. So they are usually made to replicate houses. So they have pillars, they have symbolic doorways, they have a hearth, which is all everything is, is carved onto the rock, but they are really made to imitate um, uh, houses. So. Houses on a smaller scale, so you can see a picture of me inside one of them here. So that's why, as well, there is all this, you know, modern methodology. Uh, sorry, method mythology about that. They, these are the houses of small beings, or some fairies. Anyway, uh, there are there are quite a lot of challenges when you want to study or understand these monuments. So one of them is about documentation. So they are quite tricky sites to survey. Uh, one reason is because they are, there's a combination of uh, underground structures and open air structure, and also they tend to be quite large sites. So cemetery can be uh, can be a series of different tombs over <coughs> several hectares, and in a quite challenging landscape with kind of different slopes and the rocky faces and so on. And the other challenge or issue is that there's generally lack of, of context. So uh, it's a bit of a paradox in Sardinia. You have rocket tombs all over the place. So we know where the dead were, were you know, living and where there are little houses, but we don't know where the living warehouses. We don't have much evidence for the villages. So uh, one of the uh, one of the research party for the future in Sardinia is to find those settlements and to understand how they work together with the with the cemeteries. So uh, I'm going to speak mostly about the. Uh, I shouldn't keep moving. I should stick with the camera. Uh, this is more about the mythology aspect of the project I'm going to talk about today. And so I was interested to, to try methods or the, the package of different methods that would help me to face these challenges. So a method that creates a comprehensive recording for of the entire cemetery but at different scales, so from the landscape to the architecture of the tombs and then to the, uh, to the decorations. And also for the second uh, challenge, this method would help me to retrieve settlement evidence and to look at those landscape relationship between settlements and cemeteries. So the case study we worked on two years ago, what, two, in the summer 2017, is a site called of Mezu and Montes. So it's a very typical late Neolithic Sardinian rocket tomb cemetery. You can see with the red arrow, the cemetery is located here on the on the rock cliff. You see some of the openings of the of the tubes, but they are quite discreet in the landscape or the white. And you can see all the landscape around. So you have a, a mixture of limestone plateaus and then valleys, and it's, it's quite a eroded landscape, but also quite a challenging one to to field work in in general. So. One of the first uh, steps we've done is to document the architecture and the art of the tomb. So there are 17 tombs in the cemetery. Each of them were 3D uh, modeled using photogrammetry, which is a pretty standard now, I think. Uh, but one of the issues with photogrammetry, as you know, is that they tend to create like, floating models. So you have a 3D models, but you don't know where the north, the south, 
top to bottom, so we can just try to reorient manually your three model, but it's not very accurate. So that's why we integrated uh, targets on the uh, on the models, which were for which we had a very accurate uh, GPS point because we were working with this uh, uh, portable differential GPS, where which allowed us to have an accuracy of up to one centimeter. Uh, so very accurate GPS uh, data. And then the points were included into the model, which helped us to orientate them very accurately. But just to double check, uh, to have a kind of backup security in terms of orientation of the model, we also use uh, small targets which are placed inside the tube uh, with the laser uh, level, so as you can just control that the, the tube was correctly flat. That makes sense. Okay. And then there is a slightly more difficult issue of the, the landscape setting of the tubes. So it's good to have models for each individual tube, but then if you want to have a recording of the entire complex, you need to integrate the landscape. So for this, we did something as well, which I think now is pretty standard. So we used a drone and we did photogrammetry uh, of the landscape around the tube. So uh, a few manual flights, but most of the flights were done automatically, which allowed us to have a very good coverage in terms of uh, photography and then we combine as well ground control points across the area so as we could produce a georeference 3D model at the end. So we had this 3D georeference so 3D model of the landscape and my colleague Florian Sula who is the, the co-author of this paper uh, so he's very good with GIS so we've done all the, the post-processing in uh, ArcGIS so we created the, uh, the, the DTM model, so the digital terrain model out of the, the pine cloud, from which we could then create an upper photo and also a control map of the entire area. Because all the idea we have from the beginning is to have a very detailed documentation of this complex symmetry. So, so that's the starting point. We have the map. So just to point you, the symmetry, the tools are located here. You can see the small black points um, around the, uh, the around the cliff, and then we try to merge together the the two data sets, so the three D models of each individual tools, together with the general three D model of the landscape, which proved a little bit tricky. And here, that's where I reached my limits. I'm not very good. I'm good with you know just creating simple models, but when it's about more animations and working with three D data, it's not very my thing. So we managed to do, uh, you know, using the, the, the GPS coordinates of, of all the models, we managed to merge them together. But here there's a little bit of an issue of computer power and we are a bit limited at the moment. So we managed to have one chunk of the symmetry with the tombs all together. So that you're, here you see it's a small part of the landscape with tomb 1 to tomb 15 all together. And we put it online through Sketchfab, which I'm sure you know about. Uh, so we have the, the complete model that's a bit hard to navigate, so I'll probably need now to work with people who knows about 3D animation to make this easier. Uh, but one of the uh, other things we were interested to create, not just, we were not just interested in creating like uh, more public outreach visuals or 3D animations, we wanted as well to create more high quality standard uh, or academic style visuals. So that's why we created uh, this kind of plan. So it's uh, something we've done mostly uh, post-processing the, uh, the 3D data in graphic software, like Adobe Photoshop or Illustrator. So we have like a, a detailed map. It's not a very good projection here, but that's uh, the same area I've shown before here. So you see the different tombs, and then the topography, and then you have a, the auto photo as well together. Or uh, that's a vertical auto photo of the symmetry where you can see the entrance of all these rapid tombs together. And again, this it's it's maybe technically simple, but that's really something that is missing at the moment for those symmetry. So what you have in the current documentations are usually small black and white contour maps of the tubes and that's pretty it so it's good to have this more contextual information and visuals about those tubes 
so we, we use as well the 3D models to create, again, those more conventional styles, uh, but maybe more detailed plans of cross sections, so just to give you a few examples. Uh, so that's a plan of two, number one, if you recognize as well the, uh, the entrance, the main chamber, and then the cell, the variable cells on the side. Uh, cross sections as well, just with the human scale here, and the chamber, and the main chamber, are some details as well of the decorations, which you can also see to very nice photographs by my uh, local colleague, Nicola Castanke. Uh, working on this georeference model, we're also interesting to think about some archaeological questions as well, and one of them, which is a bit typical for uh, monuments or, you know, Megalithic monuments in general, is about the orientation of the tombs. Uh, often there are you know, discussions on how the tombs are aligned to specific landscape features, so we wanted to kind of explore these ideas. Uh, those rocket tombs, they are very linear structures in terms of design, you know, they have the consistent succession of different rooms or chambers which are delimited by small doorways. They're really thought out as really linear architectures and it's easy in a way to, to look at where the tombs are looking into because if you sit on the back of the chamber and you look through the alignment of those doorways, you can something like this here, you can see exactly where the, the tomb is pointing at, but you can also double check this by you know, creating that just, just lines of the plan. And in this case, what was interesting is that the, uh, we realized that the tombs were not aligned, they were not built you know, just perpendicularly across the rock face, which would make sense from a purely technical point of view. If you were to build a rocket tomb and you had a rock face, you want to you like your tombs to be you know, expanding perpendicularly, but here they are slightly oblique, which suggests that they were interested in having a very specific orientations towards something in particular. So if you look at these pictures here, for example, some tombs are oblique that way, other tombs are oblique that way, and if you look at the bigger picture, uh, if you imagine all those tombs being that big, you know, laser guns, they are targeting, they are converging towards the same point of the landscape, which is the, uh, the, this big plateau here called the mountain man, which is the, the big hill. So the, set, the tombs are here, some of them are quite distant from each other, but they tend to converge towards this mountain manu, which can be explained by different reasons. Maybe it's just because it was very important cosmographically for those people, but there might be also other, other explanations. So I move to the, to the other aspect of the research, which is about the uh, researching the settlements. Uh, so one of the first steps we've done is just to create those very basic uh, predictive modeling through GIS. So um, I don't need to go through much of the details here, but it's just to identify possible areas where the, the settlements might have been because you have a flat land and not too far away from the symmetries here. The catchments is about 2.3 kilometers. But of course, the best method to search for evidence is to do more detailed observations in the field. So we have done some quite intensive field walking in the area. Uh, so we, every time we found the small bits of flint or shirt or oxygen, we were taking the points. So it was part of a thorough uh, work, the bit tiring one as well. So we've covered 19 hectares and we've collected 15,000 uh, surface finds. And again, we had a very specific point, the GPS point for each of them. At the time of this project, we had no uh, permission to collect the finds, so we have it now, but at the time it was a bit annoying. So what we've done is that we, when we found like a very diagnostic piece of material, like a, a stone tool or a, a shirt, which has a specific uh, you know, handle or thing like that, we recorded in 3D again using photogrammetry right on the spot. So you see the picture here. It's me with a small setup with the camera and a small turning table and the, an artifact which is being photographed for, for this 3D processing. Uh, so the main, the main outcome of this intensive field working is the creation of the map of distribution of the surface finds. So we have uh, for example, here a map of the distribution of the ceramics, and here the flints and the obsidian, and they are showing a very clear pattern. So they are all concentrated in one specific area here on the 
on the, the western slope of the Monte Mano, which, which suggests that you certainly had a settlement here just on the top of the plateau, and this is just the, uh, the erosion <coughs> that I explained the spread of material across that particular slope. And this is also suggested by evidence, or the type of evidence we found on the plateau of the Monte Mano. We found post holes cut into the bedrock. Uh, and some kind of stone buildings which don't look very modern to us. So, of course, the next step now, and that's the plan for next summer, is to do excavations to try to find more evidence of that certain site. But uh, based on the evidence we've collected on this, on this season, so looking at the, uh, the diagnostic surface finds and the, uh, the architecture of the tombs across the site, we have a very good consistency between the cemetery site on one side and the sediment site on one side, which were both used from the Middle Neolithic up to the Middle Bronze Age. So that they work very well together, the cemetery site and the sediment site. So a few conclusions, I think I'm still in, in time. Yeah. Uh, so about the archaeology, that was, that was, we, quite, we were quite happy because we managed in a way to have for the first time, a very complex, a very detailed story and comprehensive uh, visual documentation of a quite complex site, a settlement and a rocket tomb site together. Uh, we were happy as well to have found this new settlement site, so that brings more you know, life into this very big landscape of the dead. Uh, and uh, the pattern, the landscape pattern as well is quite interesting. It's not the topic of this, of this paper, but you know, you have that has something about this, in a way, the social relationship between the dead and the living, because you have the, the settlement site and the cemetery who are spatially separated, but they are looking at each other constantly. So there's visual connection, which is interesting here. Uh, from the methodology, uh, as well, we were quite happy because everything, at least for us, was quite experimental. So we were not really sure how they would all work together, but it proved to be quite su successful in terms of our objectives. So we're going to apply this methodology again to other sites in, uh, in the region, so hopefully we can find more settlement sites and uh, yeah, other features. And yeah, I think that's, that's all for me, so thank you very much for coming down to listen to me.